Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the, um, the Global Health Network for the invitation and the associated partners. Um, now we're going to begin session five, improving health research methods and processes. And I have given the, the task of introducing the speakers, which we can do. But also um, the reason I'm here is because we have uh, in Peru uh, an extended research network that uh, began as a monothematic but multidisciplinary research enterprise focused on a single disease. And along the time it expanded to be including different aspects of research in this disease. And eventually as the critical mass of researchers was expanding, we went to host uh, collaborating groups of different uh, expertises and different focuses and became a center for global health in an university in Peru in Lima. And there are some aspects of that that I probably are probably worth of transferring, conveying you this morning. And I will say probably the most important thing was capacity building. So we began as a very focused research enterprise and our researchers were incorporating into a master's programs and PhD programs overseas. And then they returned to Peru. So to date, we have approximately 30 PhDs in our group that have been trained overseas, have returned to Peru. And each of them in most of the cases has built their own research group, which expands and expands and expands the research network and opens it to different um, subjects, different focuses, different uh, aspects and different diseases. And uh, this uh, has resulted in a series of large studies. And probably the only one I want to mention is a large study that we did with funding from the Gates Foundation, which was not focused on diagnostics or therapeutics or clinical evolution of the disease, was focused on in ten, attempting to eliminate transmission of the disease we work with in a large area of the north of Peru. And in order to do that, we had a seven years project that included uh, work in different aspects, including epidemiology, education, uh, community approaches, inter biological interventions in the human and the animal population. And during these seven years, and with a total funding of approximately $20 million, we were able to interrupt the transmission of this disease in a large rural area of approximately 100,000 people. So this, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this was a multidisciplinary, locally driven effort to uh, driven by research from Peru that put a landmark piece to demonstrate that this disease could eventually be eradicated. And so that's the kind of products we will really like to, will really like to see in translation and, um, and from each of all of, all of your groups uh, eventually. And that's what the Global Health Network is for. Uh, having said so, I think we can go straight forward to the first speaker. So it's a pleasure, personal and academic, to introduce you, I don't. I know I don't need to introduce Trudy Lang. Thank you, Trudy. Um, I was um, encouraged to make sure we had a session um, around the, how the Global Health Network came about and um, and what it's all trying to do um, over this conference. It seemed um, a bit odd, I suppose, not to really talk about um, the sort of detail of what this is about because this is everybody's story and um, and and it's all around how it's it's going to be taken forward. And um, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, to explain what we're really trying to do in a little bit more detail, having just referred to it all uh, yesterday and today. So um, we all know that we're here because um, there's just not nearly enough focus on capacity building. It's the, been the theme of every talk and, uh, and obviously the whole um, push of the conference is to try and work out how we can enable more research in every healthcare setting. The um, I think the other point is apart from the fact that there's just 
remains this, you know, everybody used to talk about the 90-10 gap and the 90-10 publications, which were around, you know, 90% of the world's research benefiting 10% of the population and where all the funding goes. And um, you saw some nice slides yesterday that Vasi showed us around where the, uh, the funding is driven. Um, it's also around um, shifting how research capacity development happens and the old norms of um, teaching a group to collect data for um, a product development trial and the data was going off elsewhere is history, I hope. And, um, and what this is all around is creating lasting, capable, critical mass of not just research capacity, but research systems and management processes and everything you need to deliver good studies. But the, a really important point I want to make is that there's a huge evolution going on in health research and it's happening really quickly and it's really exciting. And my absolute conviction is that research in the most challenging places in the world should be driving that methodology. You know, there are huge opportunities to do really clever things like it's called synthetic data analysis, where you're randomizing within a database rather than at a patient level or looking at real world data. Somebody asked us in one of the meetings yesterday, can I use real world data to answer our questions? Yes. And it should be the nurses doing that, community health workers, everybody who's involved. So research is changing really fast. But don't let that be, you know, the really you know, very sort of niche research and really expensive um, areas of the globe that, are, that have taken this forward. Um, we've, we've seen in history how some of the best research has happened in the most remarkable settings where evidence is needed. And so we need to make sure that how we build teams and train people to do research keeps up and actually, I think, leads the charge on how research happens and makes sure um, that nobody's left behind and there's equity in access to doing the best, best cutting edge science and using the most um, cutting edge methodology. Um, we use um, this slide um, in lots of the talks the teams give around, um, and we've heard the phrase used a lot the last um, day or so about the research ecosystem and how we need to not just focus on clinical trials. And, we saw that in COVID, of course, and the diagram here is from the, um, the COVID community of practice on the Global Health Network. But actually, I think Zika is a really good example of why um, we need to think about not just clinical trials when um, we're thinking about capacity building. Um, in the Zika outbreak, which many of us here were involved with, and we had a beautiful presentation from Gustavo yesterday, there were not any clinical trials. You know, most of the disease was asymptomatic. There was no way of where would you put a treatment. Um, there was some thinking about vaccines, and then that shifted from who would you vaccinate because it was the beginning um, evidence we had. It was completely vector borne, and then that shifted later because there was some sexual transmission. And all the evidence was coming through from vector biology, a huge amount of social science, as we heard yesterday, observational studies to understand what was happening with transmission and what was going on, um, and then working with the mums and the babies as they were born. And it was um, all of those pieces of research that were needed. And the, um, the amount of evidence that came together over Zika was remarkable. And a lot of that happened in places where there was no previous experience. And Ebola was, was also true. But then we had to galvanize um, research capabilities in places where evidence was really lacking. And so for any disease, we need that whole ecosystem of research. And it needs to happen in the diseases that have been with us forever and obviously emerging threats and outbreaks. But the really exciting piece that makes this work in terms of capacity building is whatever study you're doing, and this is what I was talking about earlier with this research framework, the components are the same. You need to set a good question. That question needs to measure the right outcome in the right place on the right community. It needs to be happening in the right setting and you've talked to the community about is that setting appropriate to answer that question and are you going to be able to measure the outcome that you need to measure or are you going to have to find a different one how are you going to operate that how are you going to train the staff how are you going to work with the community how are you going to collect your data accurately and and well and then how are you going to take those findings back into evidence and practice and so those pieces can be taught and can be supported and they can be switched to any one of those component areas. And so what the Global Health Network is all around is about teaching those skills. And this conference is deliberately disease agnostic and deliberately study type agnostic because we're trying to work across that whole ecosystem. 
and deliver all of those skills through these whole different mechanisms that the whole program has been developing over the last decade to make sure that everybody in the team is able to understand each component step of doing a good quality um, health research study. So what does the Global Health Network actually do? You've heard, you know, many of you um, go online and, and access the courses. Many people are really involved in, um, in some of the regional programs. Um, but what actually does the Global Health Network do to transfer that knowledge and bring equity to access to those skills and resources? Well, it works online and it works in the regions, but it's all about taking um, this, it's like osmosis, I hope, <laughs> that you've got um, teams with incredible experience and skills, and they could be working in the very same hospital as a group that has never done research before, or in the same country or the same region. Or you could have a group working in Brazil, perhaps on um, on dengue, and um, and then there's another team in um, in a different part of the country who've got want to do research on dengue and they have no experience. So how do we transfer those skills um, across diseases, across geographies and between groups? And how do we do that at scale? And it's by looking at all those component areas and working out where there is expertise and how do we transfer that? How do we connect that excellence? And another area I want to call out is research management. I always say, if you can't um, win and then manage a $2 million grant, you're not going to be able to um, to, to go to the funders and ask for that money, let alone deliver the research. We have to think of research management as part of the science. If we're gonna build lasting, capable, independent teams, they need to be able to win grants, manage them, hire the team, do the project management. And so all of those pieces need to be part of this too. And so I'm sure you've all seen the online platform um, and it's a, you know this vast um, vehicle for all of this that we've built over the last 10 or 12 years. And it's it's become you know a remarkable digital tool for making sure this knowledge can move, um, but it is just a vehicle. What it really is is the, is the groups that have um, a hub and their own area within this community of practice, and so we have over sixty separate groups, each working on their own. Um, perhaps it's a research network working on something like brain infections, or it's a group who's got a shared interest in say community engagement or social science or health economics. And we've had some great ideas even come forward today I might shout out Victoria and make her stand up and um, Victoria came along yesterday and said can we have an area for early career researchers and you certainly can You've, this is the Globe Health Network is everybody's and we will happily make sure there's an area for early career researchers that goes up as the next new community of practice so you have these component topics and, and themes as uh, all operating as a community of practice and all under this overarching community of practice for health research and so this enables research groups and organizations and perhaps networks or project teams each to work and use that technology that's on there. And then the whole platform can be accessed by team members, each other, but also the frontline um, research teams, lab staff, health workers, clinicians. This is the people that come to the Globe Health Network every day to access a training course or to find an SOP. And, and that's how they end up in these communities of practice. And the dream scenario there is this is this access to information and resources and knowledge. So, you know, my ideal situation would be, say, a researcher in Nepal wanting to work on leishmaniasis and she's not got, um, you know, she, she's not really sure where to start. And she begins to look and suddenly she's um, pointed information that she didn't even know existed. And so she's maybe she finds a video on um, how somebody did community engagement on visceral leishmaniasis somewhere else. Perhaps there's some data standards that she didn't know was there. Um, and so she can work to the same standards as everybody else. So the data she collects can be shared. And then she does um, a course on search ethics and finds a template protocol. Now, all of a sudden, she can do the exactly same standard research as somebody in Harvard, Nairobi, anywhere. And that's the point that we, we want to really develop this digital technology so it makes recommendations. And so people can find information they didn't even know existed. And that wherever you are in the world, you can collect and gather the, exactly the same quality data and design your study as well as anybody else in the world. And that's what our goal is, is to try and all work together by putting that information in and then creating these digital systems and for translating it. 
but it doesn't just happen online. And the really exciting thing we're talking about today with these um, banners either side of the, of the hall is this transition to the global south. And this is what we've been talking about um, today um, and, and yesterday, of course. And it's really exciting to be um, at this point, and you're going to hear much more about this later on. But I just wanted to show this um, deliberately overpopulated slide. Um, thank you to our funding from um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Welcome, and, and many others. Um, there are now this vast army of um, Global Health Network coordinators working through the, all the coordinating hubs and centres you can see. And they're actively working to set up things like research clubs in hospitals, data science clinics, um, mentoring systems, and they can work as well if people are working on, say, um, looking at um, a new process for um, delivering community engagement or a new process in health economics, or um, maybe we've, we're all beginning to talk about some ways to design studies in a different way those coordinators can go out to the regions and run a session on that. They can do a supported less session. So for anybody trying to um, disseminate some of your work or some new processes, these people can work and help you um, to get that out and really escalate your, fi your findings and also get these new methods out into the regions. And so um, some of the achievements we've made on this is over the, um, Two, um, 2.7 million online training courses have taken. We've had thousands of people attend workshops and we've done those in the region and in, and in person. And it's really making a massive difference to um, just mobilizing all this information, as I say, like osmosis from these uh, centers of excellence um, to the centers of less experience. So we talked about this quite a lot over the last few days. This is a really important element to this that um, we're setting this up as a structure that there's no one leader. Um, it's a coordinated, uh, decentralized system of um, any number of hubs across the globe, and they can each run um, their own program and be the Global Health Network, Ghana or Nepal or <clears throat> any number of countries and uh, win funding to take these work forward and have their own coordinators. But everybody works together through these shared standards and this uh, shared ethos of translating this knowledge and information. Just a quick um, shout out for an opportunity. Um, I talked about these new methods and I've talked about uh, teens learning how to do research. We have this concept called a Pathfinder project. And this is where if um, a group are trying to say, get a new question from an existing data set and they're not really sure how to do it, then the Global Health Network um, facility and, and, and probably the local coordinators can help work with them and take them through that process. But also in doing so, track that and work out where the pinch points are, where the areas of difficulty arise and document it and then map that as a process and where the solutions were found. It might have been a data management system or, or working out how to get permission for using the data, whatever it might have been. Or it might have been setting up a social science study um, or pretty much any of these questions. And we, those can be tracked and managed, and then we can gather data on this evidence of the methods that were used, and then others can share and use them. And we would really like to hear from anybody who wants to help work on a Pathfinder project with us. So my last slide is an invitation to all of us, and we've talked about this so much. You know, get involved. The Global Hub Network is everybody's um, facility. Um, it's this open um, franchise platform and system and there's any number of ways that you can get involved either um, hosting a global health hub in your country um, running some of these regional activities contributing your resources online um, or taking part in these um, pathfinder projects so it's been great to take you through that today um, and really you know chat to any of us and um, and just if you're not involved already then um, very welcome to do so now so thank you very much I think we'll take questions at the end Thank you, Trudy. I, I'm sure many of you will have comments or questions, but we will take all the questions at the end of the session to minimize our time timing stress. We have six talks uh, and methods and processes coming from different parts of the globe and uh, approaching different subjects, uh, including community participation, clinical trials, national systems, etc. So the first one is Jill Black, the Director of Sustainable Livelihoods Foundation in South Africa, and she will present participatory visual methods and the mobilization of community knowledge, working towards a more equitable research process. Please.
Thank you and good morning. Um, thanks for organizing such a brilliant conference, uh, Global Health Network, and also for the opportunity to speak this morning. I'm Jill Black. I'm from the Sustainable Livelihoods Foundation. We're an independent research and engagement organization based here in Cape Town. And it's amazing to know that we are now part of a collaborating center with the World Health Organization. Fantastic. So my contribution to this session this morning is going to be based largely on an engaged research project called Enhancing Capacity and Reducing Risk Through 15 Best Bets for Transformative Adaption with Vulnerable Residents on the Cape Flats. Um, and the purpose of this project was to work with community members from three highly marginalized areas in Cape Town uh, to um, identify potential interventions to counteract three environmental hazards, those being fire, flooding, and water shortage. So my talk is not on a health issue, it's not on a disease or an illness, but it's about a situation which has massive ramifications for health. So we worked in three communities. We worked in um, an informal settlement called Overcome Heights, where we were looking in the context of fire, an informal settlement called Sweet Home Farm, we were looking in the context of flooding, and a large township in the northern suburbs of the city of Cape Town um, called Delft to look at water shortage. It was a three-year project. It just finished in October this year. Um, and within the context of those three years, we worked with 48 community members. We followed a participatory visual methods approach, and this involved digital storytelling, where the co-researchers who were working in focus groups per community setting um, shared experiences of lived experiences of fire, flooding, or water shortage, depending on which um, setting they were living in. Um, and these were these stories were illustrated and described through narratives and um, stitched into short. Uh, short films of three to four minutes in length. So these are very individual, very personal stories. Building on that, and we went into community mapping and then photo voice. And we went through this um, uh, layered methods approach, this superimposing methods to build a very um, rich picture of community experience, community knowledge and community uh, ideas. Um, and going through this progressive uh, research inquiry enabled a, a very rich understanding of what could be done before, during, and after these climate-related events to mitigate their impact. What can community residents do for themselves and what are they unable to do? What kind of assistance is available? And where are the gaps in responsiveness and support? Once all the visual materials had been generated, all the stories, all the photographs, and all the maps, um, we worked, we facilitated, our team facilitated a participatory analysis process with the um, community members, whereby they uh, reviewed all of their stories, maps, and photographs, democratically decided together on which visual materials illustrated the most significant problems and solutions, they then work to triangulate the data within these uh, visual materials and then formulated these best bets, best bets to counteract flooding, fire or water shortage in their communities and similar communities. Um, and work to draw to over take from these overarching best bets to draw out potential interventions in more detail. And to give you an example of the best bets to counteract water shortage, so th these best bets were formulated by our co-research partners in Delft, improved infrastructure, upgrade, fix and install more, especially around water meters, making Jojo tanks available. So Jojo tanks is um, a word that's used for, for water tanks. It's just a, a brand. Better communication from the municipality about water cutoffs improved engagement by the municipality, come into the, come into the township, meet the people, talk to the people, and better understand their water challenges. Household innovations um, within, within households, within community to save water, and use it, using public places and spaces to promote knowledge and awareness about water challenges. 
And these were further unpacked, um, asking, well, in order to use public places for awareness raising, for example, what is actually needed to make that happen? Why is that needed? What, what's the driving need behind that best bet? Who is responsible and how can it actually happen? So really drawing out the potential interventions in more detail. Once the best bets had been formulated and the potential interventions had been drawn out, we entered into a phase of engagement. There were three community engagement events, one held in each of the participating communities in Overcome Heights, Sweet Home Farm and Delft, where community members, the co-research focus groups presented their own stories, their photographs and their maps to wider audiences within their own communities, other NGOs that were uh, living and um, working in the area, and some members of local government who also attended these events. And, and then the, pro the final activity in this project was to bring all of the co-research groups together from these three research settings and to engage with policymakers. Um, it's an indaba, it's a, a word for bringing together of many different stakeholders in the South African context. And the idea was that the, the community co-researchers um, presented their best bets in this large forum and then went into breakaway groups per environmental hazard um, with uh, government representatives who were relevant to the environmental hazard that they were concerned with. The best bets were literally put on the table and they were discussed and um, debated and um, a lot of knowledge exchange and, and co-production of knowledge happened at, those, at, that, at that event. So the challenges um, with this kind of work is uh, continuity, um, both in terms of when you're working, doing um, very in-depth engagement processes with um, people from different communities on different um, topics, different environmental hazards, essentially, um, that continuity of keeping in touch can be quite challenging. Offering meaningful benefits and outcomes to participants, to co-researchers, the element of distress is always present when you are um, engaging on extremely difficult living conditions that people have to endure every day, and the disconnect between marginalized citizens and the state. Um, in terms of recommendations, build lasting relationships with communities, be present, stay in touch and follow through. And this is absolutely essential for building trust and building respect and for be being able to do this kind of, of work, really getting to know people. Foster participation and ownership through visual methods, navigate expectations, allocate sufficient time and resources and be real about what the benefits actually are. In research dissemination, it needs to be community led. That's the by far the most powerful way of making engagement happen. Real time and resources have to be invested in preparation. People living in extremely marginalized places are not accustomed to facing representatives from government. That takes time. I can't emphasize enough how important that is to get to make sure that people feel ready to take on that challenge. Work to have the right people in the room together. We have a website which is specifically dedicated to this project, www.waterandfire.info. And we have um, created a short mini documentary of the project. It's available on YouTube. You type in the Water and Fire Project. Here are my acknowledgements. Um, this was done, it was funded by the GCRF and done in collaboration with the University of Stirling. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jill. Uh, we are going to move now from the community to clinical settings. And the next talk is Clean OPS, Clinical Research Operation Training Programs in Low Middle Income Countries by Iyasu Makone Nesheto. Please. Okay, good morning, everybody. Hope you had a very nice time yesterday. So my presentation will be on Clean Up's clinical research operation training program in low to middle income countries. Uh, Addis Ababa University is the biggest as well as 
the oldest university in Ethiopia. And it is one of the top universities in Africa. It has 14 colleges. And one of the college, which is uh, the biggest one, is College of Health Sciences. It's in this college where Center for Innovative Drug Development and Therapeutic Trials for Africa, Sydney Africa, has been hosted. Uh, this center is a World Bank supported center, uh, Center of Excellence for, in, for Africa. And it has got a number of training programs, short courses, HDs, MSCs, postdocs. Also, it focuses mainly on medical discovery as well as development on drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. Uh, as you all know, ensuring the two common goods, participant safety and the credibility of the GCP requires well-trained clinical trial staff. The competency-based training in clinical trials should be given due attention to prepare site staff for effective clinical trial conduct. So the aim of this presentation is then to focus on what CleanOps program has done so far. CleanOps program has got its own unique features. It is participatory in its nature that when right from the outset on developing the curriculum, though the curriculum was first developed by the court team, but it was further developed by the PDPs and the developing competency framework was set jointly by TDR and the Global Health Network. Another unique feature of this program is it's allied to, allied to local priorities, focusing on practical problems in African trial sites. And those involved in the training were all having clinical trial site experience. It also addressed all relevant domains for effective trial conduct in this training. And it made an intensive on-job training over 10 weeks period. And monitoring and if, uh, evaluation effort has been made to meet the course objectives. It also followed innovative training approaches. Just to mention some of the innovative training approaches, it employed Moodle learning management system, which used online tool for uploading the PowerPoints. And it also gave trainees uh, opportunities to get PowerPoint online, even if they miss classes. And it also enabled the teachers to record their inputs on slides, allowed trainees to put questions, comments, and others on slides, either as a text, as well as voice record. It also followed voice rate recording, which is an interactive platform. It created discussion forum among trainees and teachers to share opinions, give comments, feedbacks, and ask questions and get responses. It also conducted live tutorial with Zoom every week for one hour, every Thursday, where summary presentation on each lesson were presented, followed with question and answer session. It provided reading materials online, classified as mandatory, recommended, and in-depth. Designed strategy to motivate trainees by providing scholarships for top trainees to be enrolled in an MSc program hosted by Sydney Africa in Addis Ababa University. It also prepared risk management plan, so the students were dropped in group, and they identified, analyzed risk, and came up with risk management plan in order to mitigate the problems which they might have faced. The contents of clean ops course have got ten lessons. Introduction to clinical research operation was first, followed with data management and biostatistics, study design and development, project and financial management, conducting a trial, parts one and two, 
closing out and reporting trial, working with external partners, quality systems, audits and inspections, as well as pharmacovigilance. These were the clean ops theaters having which experience in clinical trials. The major achievements which we, which we claim to get to have in this trade program was it has created a strong collaboration with faculty uh, capacity development college in Ireland as well as innovation. Uh, it also helped us network with trial coordinators in Africa and even the trainings, the trainees among themselves too. It created opportunity for sharing experience among trainees and it built capacity uh, of over 80 trainees in one go, established virtual platform system that might be applicable for our future training programs. However, there were some challenges which we faced. Uh, just to mention a few among the many, uh, there was a problem of falling behind the course of some trainees and high dropout rates as well. There was low participation, participation as well as technology challenges, which were mitigated by following them up and encouraging trainees to participate by sending several emails, as well as seeking IT support from Addis Ababa University Innovation too. This is a free access course. If you are interested, you can have you can access it uh, using the link shown on the slide. In conclusion, Clean Ops training program helped trainees acquire relevant knowledge in coordinating conducting trials in LMICs. We therefore recommend the training to continue to develop critical mass of trained staff in Africa. And the training could also be given in other languages like French. I would like to acknowledge the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, for its financial support and FCD for training our teachers as well as uh, course admins innovation for supporting the IT and at Saba University for facilitating the bureaucracy as well as Trinity Africa uh, for unreserved support from the inception up to successful completion of the program. I'd like to thank you all. Thank you. Um, so far we are keeping Clockman happy. So let's try to keep doing that way. Next speaker is Dr. Daniela Morelli, researcher from the Instituto of Efectividad Clinica y Sanitaria in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And she will speak about the effectiveness of a diabetes program based on e-health on capacity building and quality of care in type two diabetes, a pragmatic quasi-experimental study. Daniela, please. Good morning. I'm glad to share with you uh, this project from EX Argentina in the implementation of a program to care for people with type 2 diabetes in the province of Corrientes. As we know, it places a heavy burden on people and health systems. In Argentina, we have a high prevalence above the regional and world average. From YEX, we are working to improve the control of chronic disease through studies like this program financed by the World Diabetes Foundation. The purpose of the program was to improve the quality of care to people with diabetes through a complex intervention of four components. As you can see, research, training, e-health and audit. The implementation was evaluated using a mixed method study. 19 primary care centers from the public health system enrolled patients with a confirmed diagnosis and access to mobile phones. An important pillar in the program was the education component. 
with training professionals and commu community health workers, educators, and peers face-to-face -face before the pandemic, <laughs> in the clinical management and in self-care based on in the Argentinian diabetes guideline. These professionals in turn replicate educational activities at their centers through workshops and counseling. For us, their engagement and motivation was inspiring. In total, we equipped 20 centers. We provide resources like education material, equipment, and the health system. The health system was developed at YEX and included the app for recording data through mobile devices, a web platform, a SMS validate system to deliver bespoke messages based on the risk factors of each patient. In addition, at least once a year, we visit the sites to understand the local context, to check the healthcare process, and to retrain the healthcare teams. In total, we enroll 1,000 patients, around 50 uh, patients per site, of which 40% were new diagnoses. Most of them came to the center brought by other patients who had participated uh, in the workshops or counseling. After 20 months, almost 600 patients complied with all the visits recommended in the our guideline. Some process indicators were improved, such as glycosylated hemoglobin, foot test, and eye exam. However, we couldn't see significant difference in the metabolic control. From the qualitative approach, we found good acceptability for, uh, by the professionals, although they highlight the increase in the consult consultation time. The patients expressed support through uh, the SMS messages. During the study, we found some difficulties, like a lack uh, of medication for diabetes in public system, difficult to access uh, of auto ophthalmologists and diabetes specialists, and flooding that caused devastation in Corrientes in those years. However, we could leave some things behind. Motivate teams and his sources, support to the Ministry of Health Corrientes to expand the program to another 50 centers, scale up the project to other three provinces in Argentina, but, and almost important, we create a great bond with the funding agents, the research team, the primary care centers, and the policymakers. Join forces day by day to support research and diabetes public health. For us, this project was a good example to show how implementation study improved the process of care and influenced policy. Because despite all numbers, always about the people. Two things very important for us. In the research group, we were all women from the different disciplines. And we have supported to the institution, the EX, because it's very important to understand that research begins long before the project funding. And to have an institution that supports the researches during preparation uh, of the proposal is essential for us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. Uh, our next speaker comes from Pakistan and Fatima Kurshid will speak about promoting responsible research processes using digital technology and its impact on research content and experience from Pakistan, please.
Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Global Health Network for this opportunity. So, a brief introduction of Pakistan. Pakistan is the fifth most populous country of the world with a low health status. So, it is a developing country with a double burden of infectious diseases as well as the non-communicable diseases. The health expenditure is also below the set target of the WHO. So, uh, healthcare system with a patchy access to the research. So, do the research. Do the research output has increased over the last few years, but uh, there are limited capacities for the healthcare research with a patchy governance and oversight system. Uh, so. Research regulations in Pakistan. Uh, so there is a drug regulatory authority for the approval of the uh, drugs, or uh, uh, there is a ethics regulatory committee for the clinical trial approvals. And for medical uh, uh, regulations, we have uh, independent IRBs or uh, uh, like ERCs, independent review committees. So there is no proper mechanism in place for the post approval oversight of the research project in Pakistan. Uh, this is an uh, organizational profile of Shokat Khanam. Shokat Khanam is a non-profit cancer hospital uh, or, um, dedicated to perform high-quality research. Though it is a cancer hospital, but it has the capacity for all other type of researches. Uh, uh, research organization at Shokat Khanam. Shokat Khanam is committed to perform high-quality research as referred in its mission statement. So uh, we have a research wing based on the three sections, clinical research office, cancer registry, and the basic science lab. Uh, clinical research is mainly responsible for the oversight of the research and review and approval processes. So uh, the review and approval are done by the SRC and IRP, and then there is a post approval oversight of the research project. Uh, the cancer registry is uh, uh, like involved in maintaining the registry of uh, hospital cancers as well as the uh, Punjab cancer registry and um, uh, basic science research lab doing research on the cancer genetics, immunology, and it has its own biobank. So research review and oversight pro uh, uh, at Shokat Khanam. So uh, review... Uh, and approval uh, at Shokat Khanam uh, will be done, uh, sorry, conducted in two phases. Uh, first is the scientific review committee, which review uh, and approve the scientific content, and then it goes to the uh, institutional review board, and then we can uh, have the continuing review reports. So, research compliance and oversight system before 2018 there is no oversight system at hospital so in 2018 uh, it, we have introduced uh, started a clinical research oversight and archival system to promote compliance to the ethics review standards and the responsible conduct of the research the main core aim of this uh, training program is to uh, train the investigators, especially those without prior experience in the research on the responsible conduct of research. Prior to 2018, uh, post-approval oversight is mainly uh, done by the uh, investigators and uh, uh, this is the oversight process. So uh, we have uh, investigators training, uh, uh, GCP trainings for the response and responsible conduct of the training. Investigators are provided with the uh, training of the responsible conduct of the research with the provision of uh, a structured template before COVID and a regular review of these pro uh, documents were done by the study follow-ups and at the time of study close-out reports. So when uh, COVID, uh, during COVID, we have shifted to the online session. Initially, it was done by the face-to-face -face session. Then we have shifted to virtual meetings. Initial informal discussion with the investigators supplemented with the video trainings and the post-training assessment. Additional open access online training resources were also adopted. So use of structured templates, regular review of the research record leading to the timely identification of the issue issues, root cause analysis, as well as the corrective and preventive actions. So there is a periodic review uh, that identifies issue in a timely manner systematically through the changes in organizational policy. 
policy and culture. So this is the demographic of uh, the training program, which we have started in 2018. A total of 141 studies were assisted through this system from April 2018 to November 2022. So the most of our uh, uh, investigators, so this uh, demographic is mainly based on the principal investigators and most of our principal investigators are the residents. As you can see, it's the 58% are the residents and only 16% of overall population had the previous experience in research conduct. So program evaluation. So uh, uh, program evaluation, uh, Evaluation of any pro training program is uh, like mandatory to timely identify the issues and mitigation of the identified issues. So uh, there are various methods that are used for the evaluation of the training programs. So we have used here Kirkpatrick model for the training evaluation. So it has four levels. First level is the reaction level. So how does the participant feel about the training? And second level is to what extent participants improve their knowledge, skills, and behavior. And third is the impact of the behavior. And fourth is the results. So for the reaction level, we have used a five-point Likert scale and an open-ended question. So two-third of the population uh, uh, is, uh, sorry, two-third of the population agrees with the quality of training and investigators' effectiveness. Only one person population uh, did not find instructor effectiveness. So uh, there is a need for the improvement in training. So learning evaluation was done by a pre and post test by the time of investigator performing their pre-test they have already completed the gcp training so they have a uh, idea on uh, responsible conduct of research so the results of pre-trainings were 72 percent and the post training were 84 percent so behavior for the behavior evaluation we uh, <coughs> sorry for behavior evaluation, we conducted the, the record review and all the studies that are involved in this training program, their records are reviewed. And you can we can also we have also made this a part of our key performance indicator. So you can see the result percentage differences for the last three years, as well as the key performance indicator for this year. So we have some challenges. So shifting the training program for informal to formal training, balancing and advisory role, open communication while ensuring compliance and a human resource managing program. So we have some future plans. We further aim to enhance our video educational series to include training on the data sharing, ownership, uh, good publication practices and research misconduct. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker comes from Dubai and Canada at the same time. Mohamed Akali will speak about national health research systems from system analysis, understanding, and towards strengthening um, the case of Palestine. Please. Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Mohamed Al Khaldi. I'm working as a postdoc researcher at Miguel University scientific collaborator at Swiss TBH, and recently I joined Canadian University in Dubai. So today I'm going to talk about the health research system analysis, where we have, we conducted that system analysis in Palestine as a first national study, and we are now working in Iran to analyze the, the national health research system as well. So globally, related to the national health research. So we have seen kind of major gap in low middle income countries and high middle income countries in terms of research productivity, as well as the, the building of health research system in each country at the national and local level. Um, we have seen something about the SDGs and linking the research with the attainment of the SDGs and how we invest in research and innovation to amplify the public health interventions based on evidence and knowledge. And we started to see something like major attention and interest in research and in terms or in light of the WHO strategy that actually focuses on the uh, capacity um, standards translation as well as prioritization of the 
research topic. So universal health coverage is really bringing the research topic as an important and central issue that the national and member states should focus on. Uh, and COVID-19 has shown an important need for evidence and do integrating the evidence into the, the policy making level as well as building strategies based on updated knowledge and, and evidence. So regionally, we have really limited national health research systems built in the Middle East regions, as well as the limited number of productivity in the Middle East, especially in the low middle income countries. So some studies actually have been done by WHO Emiro office, and they found that there is a major gap in the national health research systems and building or rebuilding the national health research systems pillars in the, in the country. So at the local level, we have seen Palestine producing a good number of research, but this research is fragmented and structured, and there are a lot of things that need to be done at the structural level, resources, capacities, and the stakeholders' involvement. So just giving an overview about the context of Palestine, the, where we have their like political instability, as well as kind of military interventions, occupation, and in, in two different parts of, of Palestine. And this is really a unique situation that can be actually studied uh, in terms of health policy and system research uh, context. So there are many challenges that Palestinian health research system and health system as well, experiencing governance resources, lack of sustainability, in the capacity and resources, as well as demographical and epidemiological changes and an issue of the data and information quality and availability. So theoretically, the health research system definition, it's kind of a set of people, institutions, and actions that comes together in order to, to found or to establish health research system to generate high level of evidence or knowledge and also how we regulate this knowledge within a context or a structure. So the structure of this system that should be ideally in each country exist should be actually foundation elements or components, values, principles, and cultures, as well as the key pillars, which is stewardship, financing, resources, capacities, and the produce or production and using of health research into practices. And we call this operational or technical functions or uh, elements. So at the end, we will have the whole building, which is the National Health Research System that actually seeks to, uh, to advance the knowledge as well as using this knowledge properly in the healthcare system. So the health or National Health Research System should be linked or it's ideally linked with the health system and the overall scientific system in the country. And the study, the significance of this, this study that actually aiming to understand and analyze the health research system in order to, to strengthen it. So these are the objectives of the system that actually searching and investigating each part or each element of the health research system. We use a qualitative research uh, methods uh, t six focus group discussion, as well as tw 25 uh, in-depth interviews with the key persons in the three sectors, academia, government, NGO, and private sectors. So this is actually the first findings. We found a limited understanding and conceptualization about the health research system concepts, uh, frameworks, as well as terms. The second part, we found the health research system performance is underperforming and we have we found actually gap in prioritization of health research system topics at the national level as well as many major structural things in the governance system as well as the policy were actually lacking so this this is the the map of the health research system in palestine overlapping unstructured 
and unclear in terms of responsibilities, functions, tasks, and the prioritization of health research topic is really an issue in, in, in Palestine. And we found some discrepancies and changes in the priorities. So these are the, the level of engagement of the health research system stakeholders in the country. And we have to, to work on pushing all of these stakeholders to have high level of engagement. And here it's like a map where each stakeholder are are actually positioned in terms of health research system. So also we have a major gap in the resources and we don't see any kind of central item in the, in the government budget allocated for health research and investment. And here something about how, what, what is the status of knowledge transfer and trans translation in the country. And here is the major or the main conclusion from the whole national health system analysis. And we have to work on two level, national level and system levels. And we have to start kind of strategic dialogue among the stakeholders, as well as having political support, uh, collective involvement, as well as working on improving the culture and conceptualization of the health research system in each country. So this is a map of how we can build and rebuild a national health research system. We have to start from the global, regional, and national in order to build the foundational, operational, and also the final ultimate goals of the health, of national health research system, connecting that system with the global framework of the WHO. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. All right. We have had a wonderful tour into community studies, clinical research, national research systems. And we are having the, to, final, to finalize this tour, we are going to close with data management. And so we have a national Gao from the Camry Welcome Trust Research Program. I will speak about innovative open source approaches in automatic clinical data management for a large multicentric trial. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 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 my talk is about uh, automating uh, the clinical data management in a large multi-center multi study. Uh, I would like to begin with a thought-provoking uh, uh, quote. And, uh, I saw this online, better data is better than better models. What do you think? Okay, um, data management is the process of generating accurate, reliable, and uh, statistically sound data for analysis and decision making. Uh, in the chain network, um, we had a, a network of uh, nine sites uh, that was doing a, a cohort, which was multi, uh, multi event, multi uh, longitudinal, and, uh, and a multi center, a total of nine sites from Africa and uh, Southeast and South Asia. Um, uh, so we had a total like, like a representation of the various regions that we wanted to, to collect the data from. Uh, it was a study on, uh, mal, uh, on malnourished children who are acutely sick. And uh, so before we began, we, we thought about the data issues that would emanate from such a setup. And we, we in terms of the design issues that you need to come up with when, when designing a, a proper database for a multi-center study. And these are some of the issues that we identified. Uh, CRF uh, issues, um, inconsistencies, and, and uh, things like missing data, uh, programming errors, if you are going to have all the data distributed teams of data managers here and there, and also the time to chase for all these things. Um, the unique challenges of a multi-center study include the complexity of the setup, infrastructure requirements from the various uh, places and from the various sites, data cleaning turnaround, how, how quick, quickly do you want to get back your your feedback and uh, how quickly do you want to push back your issues in terms of queries and all that and your standardization efforts. Uh, so what we need to see happen in such a system is uh, we need to monitor data in real time or, or if, it, if, that, if that can be possible. We also need to run cleaning, cleaning queries, um, look at uh, how we standardize the reports so that we don't get different reports in different sites in different formats and also improving the productivity of the data team and not turn them into task uh, uh, generated uh, generating people. 
Um, so the solution that we came up with, with, with a, was an embedded service right from design of the study to, to the to the to the to the data collection and, 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 and analysis and we embedded critical steps in the in the in the in the process. Uh, so it was majorly a three a three cause process detection, uh, diagnosis and uh, and and editing. So this is the, the the methodology that we adapted. So we enforced uh, a, a two a two P, a peer review at the uh, we had a paper CRF that uh, to, to cater for the technological differences between the sites. So we used we asked the clinicians to enter data into a paper CRF, and then we had a peer review to review that paper CRF. Then data would be entered onto a database uh, that was online, and and then uh, we had more checks at the at the, at the database level. Um, and then behind the behind the system, we had automated scripts that were able to pull this data uh, and uh, generate uh, reports that we published them on the through a shiny a shiny platform on the web. And these reports were were, were readily available on on time. Uh, the, the refreshing rate was about 20, 10, 20 minutes, so that uh, if there are any issues with the queries and all that, that would be would be handled in a semi automated way. Uh, so the, these are the tools that we used. Um, the red cap we used red cap for the primary data collection on the clinical system and uh, we thought we looked around to get a, a lab management information system for collecting of samples but uh, we could not find one that would cater the needs of of, of, of the site so we, we came up with one uh, that we use within the Cambridge Welcome Trust it's called uh, Calif Integrated Database Management System which is customized for the, the kind of work that we do um, and then we use the, the open source tools, which is RStudio and RShiny, to be able to develop the web app application for the for, for the queries. Uh, so the benefits of this system that we saw was that we, we were able to 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 profile the all the CRFs and uh, identify the risk areas and uh, uh, put put queries and checks uh, on the automated platform, so that beforehand, as data was entered, we could be able to see. The kind of issues that we we were not supposed to see or we didn't want to see, and and, and it was easy to communicate feedback back to the sites. Actually, they had the 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 the, the access to the to the database themselves and to, and to the and to the dashboard, so they were able to see all these things. Uh, Real time checking, as I've mentioned, we managed to standardize the the reports. So we had a reporting module that had all the reports well written and standardized that for, for the needs of the sites, both uh, at the local meetings level local monitoring as well as at the coordination level where we were able to coordinate this and also we even came up with uh, other clinical utilities like uh, project projecting the enrollment curves and things like that um, so in terms of um, what what are the key takeaways from this system we managed to have a seamless data extraction process um, that was easy and with no or limited human intervention we used um, a cron service within the the computer to be able to to schedule the tasks for the extraction and the generation of of the queries and this allowed us to have automated cleaning scripts that was able to look at this data and uh, 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 send those queries over to the to the to, to, to the sites through the dashboard and for human interact for human interaction we implemented a um, task management solution which was a sort of like a ticketing system that you're able to, you get a ticket, you look at it, uh, and the ticket comes from the system. So you go to your database, uh, look at the issue, go to your paper CRF, see what is the problem and, and fix. Um, we managed to roll out our own LIMS solution. Um, uh, uh, but you, of course, if you want to implement this, you can as well look at uh, what is the solution that is out there and, and you, you, you could do this. Um, the other also takeaway is that we managed to do a clinical monitoring. We, were man we, we looked at uh, uh, the cl cl critical clinical features in terms of the quality of the data, and we, we, we asked uh, clinicians on the ground for in case there are any queries around there, and we had an improved productivity of the team. So key recommendations um, for implementing a multi-center uh, study, uh, and you want to centralize the database, Make sure that you have a standardized practice across the, the data management teams for all your all your sites. Uh, if you if you if you're able to host the database online, that is good. But if you can't, make sure you have an offline server that is able to to synchronize with an online one very quickly. We have things like RedCap Mobile that is able to work offline and you synchronize when you you get an internet connection and things like that. 
we also also you need to make sure that you're able to monitor the data as soon as possible to for any pro problems so what you need you'll need a uh, uh, probably if you want to implement this you need a server computer uh, preferably on the cloud to uh, avoid the IT uh, overheads also you need uh, uh, of course the red cap is open source you just need to write the consortium the R studio R shiny all these things are open source tools uh, you need skilled uh, human you need a data manager that is able to do this most of them are trained on on R nowadays and you need a, 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 pro, a, pro, a program champion that is able to really uh, push this uh, and drive uh, for so that everybody can adapt and, and and the implementation can be successful thank you very much thank you as i was mentioning uh, we have had a spectacular morning and we have seen different uh, scenarios and different applications of global health beginning by community studies, uh, clinical systems in hospitals, and now data management. And I'm sure we all have uh, taken a series of uh, elements that we will eventually apply in our own realities. We have plenty of time for questions. So all the questions to the plenary speaker or for the talk speakers are more than welcome. Hello. Uh interesting talk from all the speakers i wanted to start with the chip but now i know i cannot my name is palma netongo and i'm from the university of yaondo one in cameroon and i think then i'll ask my questions to the last two speakers uh you mentioned uh, data and you know crosstalk between platforms my question to you is very simple does red cap not work on a mobile device and to you how unique were the problems that you saw in Pakistan, in Palestine, in Palestine, the Pakistan is very close to you, in Palestine, and how that was, I want to put it that, how was that very unique in the way you would compare that system with the successes in Canada, and maybe put that as, you know, with the failures that you've experienced in Palestine. Was there anything that you think you could take from Canada and be able to implement in Palestine for success? Thanks. Yeah, so let me go first. Um, does, does RedCap work on mobile devices? Yes, there's a, a, mo a module for RedCap called RedCap Mobile that you can um, imp implement, but you need to do design considerations on your layout of the CRM so that it can fit on, on the device. It has an offline capability feature that is able to uh, synchronize through the server whenever you come back to the to the office or whenever you are, you are, your internet connection is stable enough to, to, to synchronize. And we recommend this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's really a very important question. So the uniqueness of Palestine case actually that has contextual differences from the other countries as well as, for example, I'm giving, we have really qualified researchers, scientists, as well as health workers, but there is no like well-structured and organized system or framework as well as the political situation is heavily impacting the uh, the whole social system in Palestine, including the health system, as well as any developmental efforts that can be implemented at the national level in terms of fragmentation in the governance, resource limitation, as well as the sovereignty and resources control, it's completely out of the Palestinian or the governmental institution in Palestine. So you are trying as a, as a as a Palestinian institution to build with the current resources and the space that you are that you you are given by the occupying powers. So it, that's why the context is unique in Palestine. But any success that can be achieved there, it's something really important, and this should be like accumulated over the time in order to have kind of you know final well-functioning systems especially in the healthcare system so it's like a accumulated efforts that finally or eventually you will have a well-built systems 
whether evidence system or scientific systems or healthcare systems. So working under kind of this pressing situation, it's also something unique and it's really successful learning uh, experience that we can we can apply it in different contexts that have the same situation. Any other questions? Yes, can we have the microphone here, please? Okay, thank you. My question is for the last presenter. My name is Oiwole Idili from Nigeria. So regarding the open data source clinical data management for automated process, we're actually conducting something similar where we are trying to see consistency between people say I have as reported on multiple sources. So in bringing this together, I think there are indicators you look out for. As a matter of fact, I just want to know what are those indicators, you know, and at the same time, what's the threshold for assessing or to ensure that you actually, you know, match these different sources together. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. So to just paraphrase your question, you are asking for indicators to look for when you are implementing a, such a such a solution. So the indicators would be one: um, how how heterogeneity or homogeneity is your data set? Are you collecting different uh, data in different sites, or is it uh, is it across a section of study? Uh, so if it is the same across, then you need to have a uniform. Uh, database and for that database we, we recommend having it online or uh, it should be somehow the same it, uh, you can have a decentralized data set but the issue will be um, things like variable names how do you how do you want to come and do your curation later on how do you how do you match these things uh, we have seen challenges in terms of the way people are coding the data sets if you have a totally distributed data database and this brings problems during analysis later on in, 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 in the stage. The other observation is, of course, the, the, the capabilities of the teams on the ground, how, how capable are they to implement um, a data management function and, and to monitor the data. Um, so if you, are, if you are the coordinating center, then you, 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 you'll be worried in terms of how soon will I want to, to see the, the queries and the issues with, with this data. And so that's why you need to be able to, to consider for all these things as you make, as you make your choice. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Please feel free to reach the speaker after the session. We have time for two more questions. Our colleague up front and somebody in the in the back, please. I have a question from Daniela. Daniela, first, I congratulate you that being a woman and being a woman group, you executed such a large research in your country. The main question is that since diabetes is a chronic disease and uh, going through the abstract and the research finding you just presented, that there was no significant change in metab uh, that HbA1c, um, but there was uptake of the health services and as well as um, the control of diabetes. The, the, in the chronic diseases, women or patients suffered from psychological problem like they having low self-management, self-efficacy, and they are mostly suffer with diabetes distress. Were you able to shed or assess that psychological parameters other than less, other than there was no HbA1c significance reduction? So the psychological parameter, did you assess that? Did you get a chance? Help me. I speak in Spanish and no go translate. <laughs> Uh, this is, I try. This is that um, nosotros no evaluamos el impacto psicológico, pero entendemos el contexto del paciente, eh, conocer el contexto local y el contacto y el entrenamiento con los pacientes permitió tener en cuenta esa dimensión el escalonamiento llevó en consideración otras perspectivas. We, we didn't directly evaluate the psychological aspects in the patient, but knowing the patient and knowing the environment allowed the team to have this consideration in the context of the whole product. 
A final question at the, the end, please. Thank you. My name is Businkosi from the Africa Health Research Institute. Thank you for all the presentations. And my question is directed to Dr. Jill Black. Um, as you know, in the settings where we conduct research, um, issues of access to basic services kind of dominate. And so um, my question is, do you have um, insights or can you share how we address this impasse where communities at one level will express issues around um, access to water, housing, which are beyond the research remit. And we have the government or as in your case, the city of Cape Town being unable to meet the participants needs. Thank you. Thanks, Busi. Um, well, I think you've you've raised a very important point about that that disconnect between um, the very marginalised communities and and the state. And what we um, found was that the 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 value of doing these kind of interventions, where we brought um, the community members together with government um, around a table and, and really gave them an opportunity to, to engage and talk and, and um, understand each other was that um, there was an opportunity to discuss what the, the real challenges are and what government is trying to do and why it's not, um, the, 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 the faces that is, the, the challenges that are actually faced by, by government in terms of them trying to implement. Um, the, the city of Cape Town, with all with all due respect to um, the very well-meaning people that sit in in our local government, it's very siloed and um, it's it's very difficult for people within the government structure to move outside of their own kind of boundaries, their own kind of departments, their own units, um, and uh, work together to try and bring more kind of holistic uh, needed change. Um, so I think what this this project really shone a light on um, kind of like the 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 inadequacies of the of, of government uh, government structures and being able to respond to some of these some of these bigger needs. But um, I think the the importance of of bringing community members and government together is that it's is a continual it, it's a continual prodding. It's a continual poking. It's like continually reminding people that work in government that they are actually accountable and they do need to be these are the issues these are the challenges these are the priorities these is this is the ways in which people are struggling and these are the priorities that need to be addressed so it's just about continuing continually um uh, uh, kind of creating these spaces so that Though the government can be continually reminded of of what its of what its job is and what the priorities for the people are, and how they how communities themselves actually want to be involved in making change happen, but they can't do everything by themselves. They need to work in partnership. Thank you, everybody. This has been a wonderful sharing of an array of diverse experiences. We have enjoyed it a lot. And again, please feel free to reach the speakers during the the break.